Uh, so, Dr. Pradeep Sharma doesn't need any uh, introductions from me. Uh, we, we're very privileged to have him here on the symposium today. Pradeep? So, see, things can go wrong in spite of uh, all your efforts. And why things go wrong? It can be an error of omission or it can be an error of commission. Okay, this side is coming. Okay. So why things go wrong? It can be an error of omission or commission when we have a misdiagnosis or a faulty planning or we make some mishaps in this surgery. That is, first thing we should see is that how we can prevent them. Spot diagnosis and spot surgery is not something which is to be done in strabismus surgery. There can be apparent squints which can be misleading and you do not have to operate for pseudo, eso or exotropias. A simple cover test leads you in. Secondly, we have to be aware of the refractive errors and an undercorrected ESO can land you into problem if you operate. So you need to have a proper cycloplegic correction and glasses. Again, don't use just torch lights. It may appear fancy, but we need to have accommodative targets for children so that their accommodation is elicited fully. And as you see here, there can be a straight eye, but the moment he sees at an attractive target, the eyes turn in. We also need to remember that we will use prisms and not Hirschbergs for a planning your surgery and the prisms when used should not be stacked one over the other. Then when children have FAK glasses and we are measuring through that, there will be induced errors because of the induced prismatic effect which will be very much so when the power of the spherical correction is more than 5 diopters. We have the 12 extraocular muscles which are interfering in the 9 gazes just like the astrology where the 9 planets missed creating mischief in the 12 houses and we have to be aware of this. So when we look at the eyes, it's not just the primary position which may appear straight and you feel happy that nothing needs to be done. It's not so. The moment the child looks up, the deviations change. When she looks down, it's ESO, EXO here. And we know the reason. It's the inferior oblique overaction on the either side which is doing this mischief. And if you identify that, you will get a proper correction. Otherwise, you'll have a problem. They may be asymmetric at times and you will have to correct them asymmetrically it's a symmetrizing surgery in squint and not symmetrical surgery always. Now this was operated somewhere and you see the eyes are straight in primary position but the moment she looks up and down, it's, the problem is there because the person has missed operating on the superior oblique overactions and then it's left to us to do it as a second procedure as a reoperation. Then there can be near distance disparities that you can have distance fixation, the divergence is much more than the near or it may be a convergence insufficiency problem, a convergence excess for esotropia and a divergence insufficiency for an esotropia. So you have to be aware of these things and then plan your surgery accordingly. If there's a convergence excess problem, you may have to add a Faden procedure and you may have to add a resection, recession on the same muscle in order to correct the incompetence that is there. Now what is the magic number to operate? That's a big question most trabismologists can't answer. Uh, and the problems are only two, under or over correction, but it's difficult to find out what is the number of legs that this elephant has. There are surgical norms, nomograms, which are there, but we can use it with uh, discretion. And because in smaller eyes, like an infant, this will have a different result, much more. And similarly so, for a myope, it will have to be more numbers, and for hypermetrope, it will be lesser numbers to correct the same. So adjustable procedure is one thing which can be done in more demanding patients when you want to have a desirable results and you can use the semi hangback or a full hangback adjustable procedure or a sliding noose technique like in this. So this is how you can do on the adjustment day. You can pull it forwards or let it be there or let it recess and correct the deviation as per thing. What we prefer is a bow tie knot, one and a half knot in order to release it and then adjust it. It's also important to see in the planning what is the cause. Now, this is an esotropia with a slight hypotropia. And the reason, if you just do a MR recession and a LR resection, it will create problems. Why? Because if you see the CT of this orbit, you'll find that the superior and the inferior recti are in the medial compartment. The lateral rectus is in the inferior compartment. If you strengthen this, it will cause hypotropia to become worsened. And what is required to be done is a loop 
myopexy of the superior and the lateral rectus to bring it back into its position. So this is the proper planning that is required. I think most of us will be aware that in esotropias, we have to rule out a Duane's retraction syndrome and never do a resection, which will complicate matters. Again, planning the surgery in Brown syndrome, if you happen to do a free tenotomy, you may correct the Brown's problem, but you will end up with the superior oblique palsy, which is actually much more problematic than the Brown itself. Intraoperatively, we have to be aware of the wrong eye being operated, wrong muscle being operated, wrong operation, recession versus resection, shifting in the wrong direction, or hemorrhages, and which will create problems of scleral perforation. So we have to be aware of these. We can have a proper technique which will ensure this. Remember, the muscles have to have full thickness bite. Otherwise, there will be a slippage, partial slippage of the muscle, which will induce more effect than what you desire. When you are measuring, it's important that where you are holding should not be used for your measuring point because it is displaced by up to 1 to 1.5 millimeter. So use these landmarks judiciously. And for very large things, you have to have a curved ruler. Now, coming to some in cases. Now, this case is a case of a ESO DRS who had come to us. And the first time the surgery done was MR recession 5, LR Y split 7 was done. He was left with an ESO but he still has a little exo on this side. The FDT was found to be positive. So first thing that you need to do in such a situation when he comes up again, look for a post-duction test. And if you still have a tight FDT in spite of the surgery, you will have to revisit the same eye and correct the problem. So what we had to do is a conjunctival recession, which was mainly responsible for the FDT, and a slight marginal myotomy, which did the trick. And then even adduction has improved compared to what it was there earlier. Another situation here. Now, there is a residual, uh, sorry, there is a consecutive case of exotropia. In childhood, she was operated by some surgeon somewhere. Bimedial recessions, 5 mm were done. And she was having all through a exo, but she never had the courage to go again. But when she is getting marriageable, she came to me and she said that, what to do? Can you do something? It was very simple. The problem there was the superior oblique overactions, which have been missed in the first sitting. And so what we decided to do was the bilateral PTSO with the LR recession. And you'll see that she is now corrected straight in down gaze as well as up gaze in the primary position. And also the hypotrophy gets corrected. Now, DVDs are very, very commonly undercorrected by your best efforts. So in this case also, this is a pre-op DVD. And the IOAT was done by somebody, but it was left over. And there is still a hypertrophy in this eye. So we will have to do something more. And so we decided to do a SR recession and a four, uh, with a Y split. Now, this is a relatively newer procedure in which you do the recession with Y split of the SR in order to induce a fardin like effect. This is another case in which there is a consecutive esotropia in a case of an exo DRS. So first time we had done it, at that time we were doing only periosteal fixation and we were uh, seeing what is the effect and we found that this turned into a slight ESO and what we had to do is the VRT, a partial VRT. So some cases may require only some additional surgery. So in this, a partial VRT has been done, which improved the abduction also, as well as corrected the primary position esotropia. But you can have sometimes a, a exo DRS still having an exo position. So this is the preoperative. And after the surgery, periosteal fixation and a PVRT done, but still she had a, a exo. So what to do? In such a situation, once you know that FDT is free, then you can do the surgery on the other eye. And then in this case, for example, the other eye lateral rectus recession has been done 6 mm, and that has improved the movement in this position also. So that is another thing which you can do in reoperations. Cases which have been operated elsewhere, you do not have any records. What do you do? Now, you only know that inferior oblique has been operated because there is a scar. So in this inferior oblique surgery was done, it was behaving like a browns. Now, under action of the inferior oblique in, uh, was there and when we explored we found that probably an IO ANT was done so we explored it disinserted the inferior oblique and reinserted it temporarily along with the MR recession of 4.5 mm in order to correct in all the nine cases so finally exploration is a thing which we have but I would suggest all the strabismus surgeons to keep the records with the patient always whenever they are being sent so finally, just to conclude, the goal as a strabismologist is not simple like a cataract surgeon to give 6-6 vision or a near vision, but we also want to ensure both the eyes to work in harmony and so that they can have stereopsis and have a real 3D vision. 
So can you all see 3D? That is important. And that is what we want to ensure all of you. So I would uh, welcome you all to have a real 3D vision in Hyderabad when we meet again in December in WSPS. Thanks to Dr. Ken Nishan. Thank you all. Sure, sure. So why split? Yeah. I worked for uh, Stephen Kraft, I worked for Tim Kraft, <coughs> John Elston. They did their why splits differently. So when people say why split, I always am interested in what exactly you do. Because, so uh, John Elston taught me to do a why split that was really just half a muscle width uh, split uh, above and below, if you're talking about the horizontal. But Stephen Kraft used to split and put them to the superior actors and the inferior actors. Yeah. So how do you do a Y split? So Y split when we are doing the, for a Duane's retraction syndrome, yeah. in such a situation you need to have a separation of at least 21 to 22 mm between the two ends that you are suturing. Right. So what I usually do is mark it, we have to resist let's say 7 mm, I would put it parallel to the insertion 7 and from those points 7 and 7 on either side. So that will be like 14 plus 7, it will be 21 millimeters. So that would be the extreme Y split, if you, especially in Duane's retraction syndrome, if you want to do. When we are doing for a superior rectus Y split, in cases of DVDs, there also we need to have at least a separation of 10 to 12 mm. Superior compartment is a little more crowded, so it's difficult to get 21 mm, but that is what we'll do. When we are using LR to MR, again we are Y splitting the LR, but then we are bringing it to the other side, and that will be far uh, separation, up to almost like 25 mm of uh, separation we need to do. So you need to have a good amount of uh, separation between the two ends to have the yoking effect. And my other question is, is where, from the tendon, how far do you split the muscle back? Yeah, so that's what I said, about 20 mm. 20, okay. So we have another question. Yes, Dr. Leela. Uh, you said you, uh, for the second surgery in the uh, recurrent inferior oblique overaction, you transpose from the nasal insertion to the temple. Exactly. Uh, what is the logic behind that? Yeah. So what has happened is somebody has done a anterior nasal transpositioning but overdone it. So here it's become a very weakening procedure for the inferior oblique and has caused an ESO also. When you do an ANT and when you bring it very close to the middle rectus, it will induce an ESO deviation in the down gills as well as in the primary position. So this was actually creating the problem for the patient. And it is also having a tug effect to so much that it doesn't allow the eye to roll up at all. So that's why to release that, I brought it on the temporal side because that was good enough. We need to do a, a quantified amount of weakening in strabismus. One uh, suit doesn't suit everybody. Sir, why do you do a Y split for DVD, for superior rectus? In DVD, yeah, this is a, uh, an, a new procedure which I learned from uh, Dr. Borgen from Germany. I had never, and I still don't find any published literature. It's only by uh, his word, when I had met him in a conference, he mentioned that he does. I still wonder why it's not yet published. We have sent it for publication, and I think we'll do that. It works just like a Farden procedure. So it's a vice split of the SR. And it works like a Farden procedure. And it is one of the things which you can do if you find that Farden is not feasible. Farden has the problem that it may prevent the movements of superior oblique when you have it in the superior rectus area. Thank Wait, you. I, I have one more question. Yes, what, So for re-operations, re what do you like your conjunctival wound to be? That's a wonderful question. Even though primarily when I pro operate, I usually use the uh, Parks or a Fornix incision. For re-operations, most of the time I would use a limbal approach. The reason being, one, that I may not know what has been done. Because many times they're referred cases, I don't know what is there and I would have to explore. Secondly, there may be a tight conjunctiva itself. Like one of the cases I showed you, the problem was with the tight conjunctiva. So if you've done a limbal, you can recess the conjunctiva. In Fornix incision, this would not be possible. So I think it's uh, better to take a limbal approach in such cases. Yes, Monica? Yeah. The thing is, uh, when you go in for re-operations and if you have to extensively dissect and ja ja go for it, and then you have, at the end of the surgery, the conjunctiva, you have to actually get it and suture it. Have you, uh, have, has amniotic membranes helped 
Okay. I think it's an interesting question. Seeing the uh, people doing a uh, lot of amniotic membrane whenever they're dealing with the pterygiums and all that. And I did uh, think about it and talk to my cornea colleagues. So basically don't require to do it. The stem cells we are not damaging. Because we are uh, incising little uh, on the scleral side of the limbus, we do not damage the stem cells, number one. Secondly, with the normal stem cells, it doesn't have any problems. Because I asked them this, that I have been doing since ages this conjunctival recessions with bare sclera, uh, sclera exposed, about 5 mm up to 5 mm. I have never had any problems of dry eye in these cases. And they said that, yes, this is so because these are all normal stem cells, normal conjunctiva. They would easily cover up in that area after you have left them. So you don't have to. Yeah. So just again with that, because we see a lot of children who have a lot of allergic conjunctivitis and BKCs yeah. and who have compromised limbus. Yeah. And so it, like... Yeah, those are little different cases. And in these, not only that, you may also have adhesions. There may be fibrous yes, adhesions, yes, yes. either because of the VKC or maybe because of the earlier surgery. Yes. In such cases, we have also used mitomycin C post-op. And we have applied the mitomycin C for about a minute and left it for a minute and then uh, covered with the conjunctiva or whatever. And the effect of mitomycin C lasts for about a month. And what Thank you. We use 0 0.04. Thank you. Do we, do we have any other questions? Thank you very Thank much you so indeed. Much. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, let me see. I, I have it. Let me do it. Mere paas hai. Here we go. Okay, and where is it gone? Uh, here we go. So, one of the things that uh, I find, uh, uh, oh, it's a problem. Can you fix that? If you can't, can you fix it or? Okay. One of the, while you're fixing it, one of the things that I found when uh, uh, I was at a stage where I had just started as an attending is that nobody ever talked about their complications. Everybody talked about their wonderful results. And I would do my surgery and get complications, and I'd think I must be useless. Um, but the fact is that we all get complications. The only surgeon that doesn't get complications is one that doesn't operate. Uh, this one, my worst complication, that one. Yeah, you got it? Okay, I'm going to switch to your... Are we good? Yes? Okay. We got it? Transplants, but I do the transplants in those cases that often nobody else wants to do. And this child was sent to me. He was from consanguineous parents. He had primary aphakia which means he had no lens. It's a rare condition, but I've seen it more often in India than I've seen it anywhere else in the world. And it's due to mutations in a gene called FOXE3, which is a lens gene. So anyway, the a child had both eyes were equally bad, and the parents wanted me to do something. The child is now two years old. He'd been seen by other places, and they said, no, nothing to do. And so I counseled the parents and I said, look, the chances are the graft will reject, but we might be able to give your child some developmental vision for a year. And so we agreed, and that's what we did, and we went ahead. So this hopefully will, there it is. So this is the eye. You can see that I've done a recession of the conjunctiva. It's a very odd looking eye, right? And I'm marking it. And the next thing is I do a trephine. Now, what's the first thing you notice? There's a lot of blood. Okay, all right, it was vascularized with fine vessels, but there's a lot of blood. But at the time, it didn't mean anything to me. 
So I move on and I start to cut down. And I'm cutting down, it looks okay. Right now, something is going on that I didn't know about. And this case reminded me to always talk to my anesthetist when I'm doing these really young children, especially infants. The anesthetist didn't tell me, I didn't ask. But something was happening at this moment in time that I was unaware of. So I start to take the button off and I'm a bit surprised at this stage. What's that? Oh, it's vitreous. Okay. So I carry on. And this is where I should have done something different. Everything's gone black. I've got no red reflex. None. And that's a danger sign. And here it comes. One, two, three... I'm trying to close the eye. I'm done. I can't save it. That's retina coming out now. So, we go again. A little bit of vitreous. There is, that's where the, the retina is starting to come out. And I try and close the eye. And it's all out. And that's what it looked like. Exactly six seconds after the first expulsion started. So, what do you do now? I couldn't close the eye. So, what was I going to do? I, I wanted to close the eye so that when I went to speak to the parents, I could at least say, I've saved the eye, but we've lost the vision, in all likelihood, right? So I did my sclerostomies, tried to drain the blood, and slowly, over about an hour, if that's me doing the sclerostomies, in all four quadrants, over about an hour, I managed to get the eye to there, where it looks like an eye again. It looks very similar to what the eye was like before I operated. All right. What was I taught? I was taught that expulsive hemorrhages are rare. I've only had one. That's it. You're supposed to have one in your lifetime. If you are a, a high volume surgeon, that's what they say. So I've had one. They tell you try and close as quickly as you can. I don't know what else I could have done to try and close that. I have now, I will tell you, in, in cases where I'm suspicious that there may be a problem, I have a different technique of doing an open sky, which I, will, I can talk about. But I was told try and save the eye. Because it's too damaging psychologically for the patient, if, if it's an adult, or the parent, if you come out and say, it was so bad I had to remove the eye. That's too damaging. You put the eye together the best you can so that there is something there. But what I wasn't told was, what do I tell the patient or the parents? Right? What do you tell them? Well, what I told these parents was, I walked in and the first thing I said was, your child is well and is in recovery. Because believe it or not, when the doctor walks in to speak to a, a parent and they have a very serious face, they don't think something went wrong with the eye surgery. They think their, pa their child has died. Right? So that's the first thing. Your child is well and in recovery. Unfortunately, one of the rare but very serious complications I discussed with you. Now, if you didn't discuss it with them, now you're in trouble. So when you do informed consent... For an intraocular procedure, you have to mention the rare but catastrophic event of an expulsive hemorrhage. I said that I discussed with you has occurred during the operation. You remember I told you that very rarely a massive bleed can occur causing the contents of the back of the eye to be expelled? Well, unfortunately, that happened. This is not good. You have to be really black and white with parents. Right now, They've just been hit by a truck. And they think you can still save the vision. So this is not good. I'm afraid the vision is likely lost, but I have managed to save the eye itself. I know this is a shock, and it is the last thing I expected to have to tell you. I'm going to keep quiet now and let you ask as many questions as you would like. If you just tell them this, 
and leave the room, you are going to be in trouble. Because they're going to feel that you're running from them. So, what did they ask me? Is the other eye okay? Yes, it is. Why did it happen? Well, it's a rare risk that can happen. I'm not sure, but everything that I would normally do, I did. Nothing new. Is there anything you can do for the vision in the eye? No, I don't think so. Thank you for trying your best. That's always the hardest, right? Because you've had a massive complication and they're thanking you. All right, so did I try my best? I looked back over the case. The flaringa ring was used, you could see that. Manitol was given. I always give Manitol to the, the, uh, the infants. And all was per routine, except for one thing. When I went back over the records, anesthesia told me that at the time that I trephined and I made my initial um, stab into the eye, there was a clear blood pressure rise and a clear increase in the end tidal PCO2. Right? And, that the, and the heart rate, just after I initially penetrated. And now... I tell the anesthetist when I penetrate what's happened to the heart rate. And actually, on Monday, I was doing a case. And after a long time, she said, oh, my God, the, the heart rate went from 92 to 138. Stop. Stop. I stopped. I'd only made one penetration. We waited. Everything came back. I proceeded slowly, and the pulse stayed the same. But there was something going on that we don't quite understand. But the PCO2 makes a huge difference. When you are uh, having a child that has a tube, and they're con or even an LMA, and they're controlling the breathing, the PCO2 should be less than 30 when you do intraocular surgery. If it's above 30, there is a chance of dilation of the choroid and expulsive, but definitely positive vitreous pressure. At the moment, we're writing a paper about extrusion of the iris in infants that is related to the PCO2 level. And we have fantastic video showing the PCO2 level being brought down to 27, and the iris that was coming out of the eye going back in by itself. So the PCO2 is really, really important. So Here's the other thing. In modern anesthesia, they try to use sevoflurane. Sevoflurane does not suppress sympathetic activity like isoflurane does. Isoflurane is an older agent. So now all my infants and the, uh, any PKP up to the age of 16, I ask them to maintain on isoflurane and not sevoflurane. They were using sevoflurane for this kid. On Monday, we had a new anesthesia guy who had not listened to my protocol, and he was using sevoflurane. So it's really important for you to control what, what you do. But remember, every time you do an infant PKP, you need a little bit of help from above. Thank you. Do we, do we have any questions? Kind of. Oh, you poor thing. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, sir, we have, sorry for my voice. Sir, we have lots of uh, pediatric keratoplasties and lots of pediatric cases. So what our anesthetists do, uh, they induces they induces the patient with sevoflurane and propofol and uh, they ask for the surgery whenever there is, suppose, a cataract surgery. So they also uh, ask us to put some uh, proparacan drops. So the surgery would be painful and that rise in uh, uh, heart rate will not be there. And in lo longer cases, such as retinal cases and keratoplasty cases, they also give a uh, peribulbar block along with the sevoflurane and they maintain uh, a very low sevoflurane level. So what I would say to you is uh, these cases had amethacane put on the eye, not proparacane, amethacane, which is longer acting. Longer acting. That's the first so should thing. we use uh, topical anesthetic also along with the uh, general so anesthesia? So the problem is when you're doing a PKP in an infant with elastic eye or even uh, cataract surgery with an implant, 
if you do a peribulbar block, you increase, increase the intraorbital the pressure. pressure, which was going to have an effect okay. on your surgery. I think uh, not a good effect. I don't know. Do, do people give peribulbar blocks? Yeah, for post at Is the end of the procedure, you could give it. But I, 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 most of my cataracts don't get pain, and order the PKPs. But, um, but I mean that's interesting. I, I, ask them to look at the CO2. CO2. See what's happening. I, I keep this, yeah, for Irish prolapse and for positive. Well, I think follow. Well, I think follow pro yeah. well, you should try it. I mean, I, I have tried when I. So I stopped doing adult surgery about three years ago, and uh, purely because my pediatric volume was too high. But when I did adult surgery, lowering the CO2, you see, most um, adults are being done under local. So you can't lower the CO2. You know, you can ask them to breathe faster, but then they start to tingle and they start to move. So it doesn't, it doesn't help. It makes things worse. So I'm not sure. I just don't know. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yes. Can you ask the, uh, the microphone? Uh, sir, I don't know if you remember, I had discussed a case of primary FAQ with you. Yes. Uh, with a lot of hesitation and uh, previous uh, bad outcomes, I went ahead after uh, advising everything. The brother also had the same problem but not touched. This eye, after a very long time, it went tricycle. Yeah. I'm afraid right. so. I can tell you that uh, I now, we're just, we've just written the report of the first eye where I did a corneal transplant in a primary A fake where the eye did not go thysical. And the reason it worked is that I had a vitreoretinal surgeon do a complete vitrectomy. And he, we put a keratoprosthesis on, temporary keratoprosthesis, and he did a complete vitrectomy. I think it took him about an hour and a half to do the complete vitrectomy. Then I put the transplant on. It's now been... 14 months, and the eye has not gone physical. But it's the only one. Because yes. the vitreous in primary aphakia yes. is abnormal. Yes, you had advised uh, vitrectomy, and we did one maybe probably that was not thoroughly done or what. I don't know. No, it has to be really, I mean, I, but you're not alone. All, all of the first four cases I did, five, I told you, all went physical. But when it's bilateral, the parents feel that you, they want to try and do something. You know, that's the problem. That's the problem. Okay, I think we'll move on now. Is it R Ramesh, are you talking next or is it Monica? Monica, fantastic. Let me introduce Monica Samant. Monica um, uh, did a fellowship at uh, uh, LV Prasad, right, Monica? Yes, yes. Very and nice. then uh, came to Pittsburgh to do a research fellowship with me. And she is now going to talk to you about uh, a wonderful development at WSPOS that she's leading called the Global Consult uh, uh, Bureau, or uh, sorry, Case Quiz, and she'll explain how yeah, it works. So, can I have the light? light? Okay. So, so, um, so I'm, I'm Dr. Monica Samant, and I work at Lakshmi Eye Institute right now, and it's in Panvel, India. So, let's see how this this matters, how this, this slide matters to the presentation. So if you see India, it's huge, it's diverse, and it's densely populated. So we have a diversity in culture, we have diversity in our different levels of socio socioeconomic strata, and we have diseases which come in all forms. And the rare, even though it's rare, when you are so much populated and you have so many patients, that rare is also something that you might face in your practice. So rare exists, though it is rare. And me still being very young in my practice, I had this day when I had this child come up to me. And that's how the, we started the case. This was a three-year-old female child who presented with decreased vision in the left eye to us. She had a right eye operated for penetrating trauma, which was done a month ago elsewhere. So this is actually how she came to us with her father telling that this child is unable to see. And they were like surprised because they knew that the left eye was always good and that she was able to see post-operatively for some time. And now suddenly this was, her vision had really dropped down. And this is how she looked. This is how her right eye was when she came to us. 
And this is how her fund is. She was photophobic, so it is not possible to take any of her slit lamp pictures for the left eye. So if you see, the media is hazy. There is an exudative retinal detachment here, which is seen. So on examination, her vision was PL in the right eye. Vision in the left eye was close to face. There was a thick membrane in the anterior chamber. The posterior segment was barely visible. So we did a B scan, which had a choroidal thickening. And with all the clinical findings, it all pointed out to left sympathetic ophthalmia. So there I have a three-year-old, a rare thing. I'm looking at sympathetic ophthalmia. And yes, I'm in Panvel. So, and I, I have a patient who has come to me who is a daughter of a migrant worker. So most of us, I mean, all of us rather, sitting here, come face with this challenge where I want to give the best. I want to do everything. But maybe it's me or maybe it's my patient who may not be able to do, get all of it. Maybe not, whatever the reasons. There may be financial reasons. There may be unawareness. There may be illiteracy, what they know of the disease or my uh, experience on it. So all of it together. And I was actually facing that during this time. So I left eye, sympathetic ophthalmia, three-year-old, parents, migrant workers coming from Uttar Pradesh to Panvel, and I'm struggling trying to tell them the disease. But they agreed, and I went, saw the literature, called my teachers, asked them, and we had, like when a sympathetic ophthalmia presents, we went with the protocol, treated the child with systemic and local immunosuppressions, this was what happened at one month. Her vision was 6 by 36. The fit picture, the fundus was clearing. At the end of six months, she was 6, 12, 6, 9. I was happy. The patient was happy. The parents, everything went nice. And so I was like, okay, we're doing it. And we're going to be there. And over a period of time, we will be tapering the immunosuppressions. And she'll be fine. It was already tapered to a large extent. So the next thing which all of us again see, what happens is... This patient is lost to follow up. So A, they think that the disease is gone. They think it's improved. Now, because it's so rare and everything in ophthalmology is equal, equated to cataract, that you operate or you treat, you have it once, it's gone, and it's gone forever, I don't have them coming to me. The next time they come is after six months. That's like one year from the primary First time they presented. And look at this. We are back to square one. I am from where I started. I'm just there again. And I'm now, now it's still more difficult because now I go back to literature. I already have a rare. I have small, scant literature on it. And now this is like a remish, the recurring thing. So again, it's still scantier to go find and how to treat this. So we again... Go. So there's one, one paper on this, on a young child, a seven-year-old, where they had presented a recurring sympathetic ophthalmia, which was treated with immunomodulators. Now, immunomodulators is something I may not be able to do to my patient. So we again start with the treatment we had on immunosuppressions. And what took me six months in the first time takes 11 months. And the child is now better, is clearing, and this is what the pictures look like. But now I'm faced with a fresh problem, and that's cataract. So now it's time. It's two years since their first presentation. The child is now a little better, but the child has got a cataract now. Now I go, and I situation right now. The patient is on one anti-glaucoma medication, is having good vision of 618 and 6. We are monitoring the discs. It's still not deteriorated from... 0.6 cup that the child had but what we definitely know that is we have to go for a trap surgery and we know it's going to be drainage devices because all of the experts had an opinion that a drainage device would, would work, work better than a trabeculectomy and yes close follow-ups the next important thing which really really helped me was counseling the parents about this thing because each experts had written about it about how this could go ahead how what else could happen to this child like we need to, to look after 
more inflammations, more insights. So if you, we could go on immunosuppression, later on immunomodulators and keep seeing this. So now I was a better person to talk to the parents. The parents were in a better shape to understand things, had the confidence, and we could go ahead telling them and treating the child. So thank you so much. That's how the concept of WSPO as Global Consult came and it's helped us and I think it's for everyone sitting here and anywhere you are based, you don't have to know, know people, but you would still get best of the opinions from all of them all over the world. So all of you all, I think each one of you all can contribute to it. And see you all of, all of you all in Hyderabad for the WCPOS Khan. Thank you. So how many of you all have seen it in a child? Okay. 19 year old. A young child. Yeah. Like three or four year olds? Yeah. The other eye is God. It's, no, it's not enucleated. The patient presented to us after a month. So if you go and read by the literature, anything later than two weeks does not really matter. Even if the eye stays. It's, no, no, no. No salvageable vision at all. Uh, no, 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 no. It was thysical. It's gone thysical and quiet. Yes, it was a trauma. A trauma with a knife. No, you don't do anything for the primary eye. We did not have... You mean... So, so, so that's what I'm trying. Yeah, so that's what I'm trying to say. That if you go into the literature, a that they have put it up two weeks is the mark, and the other the the the, uh, the people we talked to or the paper I have followed, which had recurrence, also had not enucleated the eye. It has been proven that it really does not inside. Yeah. is that w w our intention is that after, um, when we reach 12, we have an, uh, an agreement with Carga to publish it as a, a hardback book. Um, so if people are interested, if you have unusual cases, even if they're cases from the past, um, you know, because it's very unusual to get really good images of sympathetic so if you have good images of something rare, then please do approach us on, from the website, and then hopefully we can start to make this an annual uh, handbook of rare cases that will be, they'll be cited in Medline. So you'll be able to get a, a citation in Medline, and you'll be able to help people, because there might be similar cases that are happening. So we, we want to try and encourage publication, even if it's at a level where it's just case reports, case reports can make a big difference sometimes to other people's lives. Yeah. Yeah, but good images is the thing, right? I mean, that's such a beautiful image to show the response of immunosuppression. Uh, it's so powerful to show how it works. And yeah, we were very grateful for uh, the different experts to weigh in and, and advise what to do. And, and by the way, anybody can advise. So they advised, but there were other people who advised as well. But we sort of said that we would just take four expert opinions. But there were other people who gave almost similar responses. Which glaucoma drops? Which one? Iopidine. Okay.
So we will go on to some special situations in uh, pediatric cataract surgery. I think all of you do pediatric cataract surgery. And sometimes when you see a plaque like this, uh, people tend to uh, do a vitrectomy. But a simple Sinsky hook can peel off this kind of uh, plaque very easily. That can make your vitrectomy much easier. So you, ju you can just inflate the, the capsular bag and then you can use this capsulorexis forceps and then it can just peel off and your next step of vitrectomy becomes easier. You don't have to struggle with the low cut rate because these are quite thick plaques. You cannot really remove it uh, just with the vitrectomy sometimes. You can do other thing like you can enter with the meringotomy knife and cut it. But gently, uh, it's like a plaque rexis. Gently you can remove it using a Sinsky hook as well as capsulorexis uh, hook. So sometimes there could be a defect, so you'll have to leave it alone. Sometimes if there is no defect, you can just cut it the last bit if it is not coming. You can cut it and then implant the lens so that uh, you will have intra-bag implantation of the lens and this plaque can be sent. So, so then you can go ahead with whatever uh, vitrectomy or implantation of lens you can do it. Other situation I, I wanted to show is all unilateral cataract, just be aware of uh, something in the UVL tissue and always perform a uh, UBM. B scan may not pick it up. So I would say use this technology wherever, unless it's a posterior lenticonus, it can be unilateral. You may not even have anything. So this uh, UBM can pick it up. And this is uh, a case of uh, PHPV. You can see these are the pictures taken by uh, red cam. You can look at the right eye and this is the left eye. This is the stock with cataract. And in PHPV, there are two types, anterior and posterior. Evaluation B-scan helps. Uh, sometimes it can be a combined surgery. That's why it's important to inform your poster segment colleagues also. And they have very high chance of glaucoma. In chocolate lens, it's impossible to put in every case because people think that you can implant in every case. The triad of PHPV is a stock, microphthalmos as well as microconia. One of the things what I use is an endocautery probe used by a vitreous, vitreoretinal surgeons. This can prevent vitreous hemorrhage. You can go into the AC and cauterize that. And sometimes they can usually have a thick plaque like. I just wanted to show one or two videos of uh, PHPV. Uh, you can see sometimes it's just a plaque like. You can see. Uh, the long ciliary process. So you'll have to really cut this. Unless you cut, it's impossible to take it out. So this is the elongated ciliary process what you see in this kind of cataract. And with the vitrector, this is endocautery. I'm trying to cauterize these vessels directly so that immediate post-op or intraoperative, you would not have any kind of uh, bleeding. And then go with the meringotomy knife because you can't cut directly with the vitrectomy probe because it's too thick a uh, plug. And once you have it, then you can cut with a vitrector. You have to keep the cut rate very slow and also the, the speed also has to be slow. And once you have it, you can see these vessels, they become uh, quite easy to remove. So this is one of the case of PHPV. And this is one of the case of uh, retinal detachment in the left eye and it complicated the, uh, the lens and you can see a complicated cataract. He is minus 8 here and this eye you can see that there is some inophthalmos of the globe because the pressure was less in that eye. And uh, Ramesh, yes? sorry, can you go back for a minute? Yes, so please. There's a spot diagnosis for this child. Yeah, we checked for uh, his uh, genetic test. He was negative, but his mother had it. 
Stickner syndrome. So he was having minus 8 from a long time and they have a very high risk of uh, retinal detachment. But his so, face, his classic face. Yes, the nose up, the yeah. epicanthal folds. Sometimes they can have this uh, very typical feature of Stickler syndrome and especially they come with congenital myopia. It's not that they acquire later. So that's the case. And what do you take care of it? Uh, uh, retinal detachment can happen because of all these uh, reasons. After RD surgery and before RD surgery. Before RD surgery, you need a clear view. And after RD surgery, what happens is typically you have a deep AC and a soft eye. And there could be an issue of IOL calculation. And you can use anterior chamber maintainer. I'll show you how we used in one of the case. So this is one of the case of uh, uh, retinal attachment and he had silicon in filled eye. You can see this silicon. Even if you remove it, it still comes and you can see this patient developed. There is a coloboma also here. So the red glow is not so classic in this kind of patients. They will not have it. So you can use uh, uh, Tripen Blue, but their cataract is very, 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 uh, you know, like they don't come easily. They are very uh, much like diabetic retinopathy and they always have a lens notch here. So you can see a kind of defect there. And once you take it out, you have to do an eccentric uh, posterior capsulotomy so that this area is exposed. and. Uh, you can still see the silicon bubble. Whatever the retinal specialist, they remove it, still it comes through this and you need to be very, very careful. So see that? Still you can see uh, behind the lens there is a lot of uh, uh, silicon. It comes through this area and it keeps on coming. So implantation of the lens uh, is possible in these kind of situations, but you need to really measure and you need to adjust your capsulotomy depending upon the situation. And if the patient has already had RD surgery, uh, this is one of the complications. Look at this uh, surgery very carefully. You can see that as soon as I enter, the antechamber becomes very, very deep. So you need to keep your bottle height very, very low. Otherwise, you will have a problem. See that? Once I enter and come out, it becomes very much. Uh, so I did not use anti-chamber maintainer in this case. Uh, probably I'll try to fast forward. It's not possible. Okay. Uh, this is the routine uh, capsular axis. His IOL power was something like uh, plus four because he was highly myopic patient and he already had a retinal attachment surgery. And this is the capsular axis. Uh, uh, forceps, uh, you can do a, uh, doing this is not difficult because he is already six and a half years old or so. It becomes easier compared to infants doing a capsular axis forceps. And here, watch it carefully. Uh, I am trying to aspirate most of the cortical matter. You can see the density of the cataract was not much, but it was affecting his visual uh, axis. You can see I am trying to remove all the cortical matter. Uh, it, it comes off easily, not a problem. Uh, just at the end of this surgery, just watch it. I am trying to come out, trying to go from the other side, trying to aspirate all the cortical matter at one go because their PC is quite stretched because of this pressure. So I don't want to cause too much of a pressure. So somehow I forgot to use a capsular the anterior chamber maintainer here. So I'm trying to polish everything and uh, it's almost over. Surgery is almost over. And there is one, see that? Just that the pressure was too much. I'm trying to take out that silicon uh, bubble. Just that time you can see this uh, Poster capsule just got ruptured. So uh, probably it could have been prevented if I would have used uh, anti-chamber maintainer, no irrigation, or I would have reduced this. The I chose this case because he had plus four diopters of uh, uh, intraocular lens, 
probably I just got away with this uh, particular case. So it's always best to use uh, anterior chamber maintainer and control your, this is one more case of Stickler syndrome. You can see a typical uh, feature. Probably I'll skip uh, this video. And spontaneous rupture of the anterior capsule without any history of trauma, which is bilateral. Always think of Alport syndrome because it cannot rupture just like that unless there is a degeneration of the anterior capsule. So this is what we are dealing with, a case of Alport syndrome. He was investigated. Obviously, he needed a surgery. You can see a defect here. Surgery-wise, there is uh, nothing much here. It's just like uh, a traumatic cataract. How do you do? Similar way, whatever area you can do a capsule or excess, continue because there is no connecting band here. Otherwise, Dr. Nischel has a technique what is called anterior band technique, which is very good. So we try to remove, uh, do a capsule or excess as much as possible and uh, remove the uh, all the material, it's just like a normal cataract and we implanted a lens in this case. I showed this case particularly to see that don't assume things that okay it could have been trauma and things like that. This is very very important, you can make a difference to this uh, patient. Uh, I will just end with retinoblastoma cataract. Usually it happens because of radiation, most of these patients. Uh, you can see their uh, skull and uh, you can see the cataract. There are some things to be taken care in RB cataract. Go for clear corneal incision, no hydro procedures. Do a capsulotomy if the tumor is regressed. This has to be clear before you do. And always use a large optic diameter of the eye well because they may need laser later. And before going ahead with the surgery, most of them, because of the dry eye, they have poor ocular surface. And if you do a PPC, always send tissue for cytopathology. This is extremely important in retinoblastoma uh, cataract. I will just show this video and then probably I'll end uh, my talk here. So any questions as the video is running, we can take a couple of questions. Can anyone? Yeah. Yeah, sure. That's that's fine. That's fine. That's perfectly all right. So, Doctor Gopal's talk is loaded, or okay? Do you want to do? Uh, Doctor Nishal can do his talk. Yeah. So yes, is uh, which is your talk? This one? No. Which one? Where's it gone? Should be that one, there it is. Do not go anywhere. Okay, it's taking some time. Okay. So, um, what I'm going to talk to you now about is we need to shut that one down. There and this one. Yeah. Um, hopefully, it'll come up. Can we? So, uh, how many people uh, have have seen or used real-time intraoperative OCT? Okay, so I'm going to, yeah? Seen. You've seen it? All right. I, I'm going to share you my experience. I've had the rescan from Zeiss for about a year now. And I, I'm really impressed with the, the technology. I don't, I don't have any relationships with Zeiss, but I think interoperative OCT is really very, very important. Leica are bringing one out as well called Enfocus. And I have no conflicts or financial disclosures to declare. So, Intraoperative OCT, what they do is they put the image of the OCT in the right objective. And the problem, if you do that, is that if you're right eye dominant, you're seeing two images at the same time, and it can become a problem. There are tricks to get around that, which we can talk about. But the beauty is that as I'm looking down my microscope, this is what I'm seeing. Um, so this image on your right is actually superimposed on the image of the, of the eye. The grid you see it gives me the two planes uh, of the OCT. So I use it for corneal surgery, obviously, cataract surgery for teaching, 
uh, complex surgery and glaucoma. And I'm going to show you how I use it. Obviously, I don't use it for retina, but my, uh, uh, my retina colleagues do use them. Uh, oops, wrong way. Okay, so for DALK, it's very straightforward, right? I use the viscodissection technique. And what you can see here is the viscodissection. And over here, if you look on your image on your left, when you do the viscodissection, this is what you're doing to decimates. You're pushing it right away. And then when you take this tissue away, there is your decimase and there is the pre-decimate layer or duas layer. It exists even in children. Sometimes when you do that, this is a case of mucopolysaccharidosis, you don't get a nice bubble of viscodissection. So the intraoperative OCT tells you that there is some visco there. So I'm able to cut down with a cannula and still get down to bare decimase. So it, it makes a huge difference. DALK has become very straightforward. Where it's really useful is DSEC. Here's a child who's uh, had congenital glaucoma, uh, had to have his lens removed, sent for a, an opinion about can we do anything about the cornea. And now that view is terrible. I, you know, you can't see anything. And because he was aphakic, I do these with Ladan Espendar because she does many adult DSEX but I know how the child's tissue reacts and behaves, so we work together. And so Ladan said, we're going to put a suture on the graft, and you can see that as she pulled the suture across, it was only because we had the OCT that we could tell that we had the graft in place. And then after bubbling, we got a nice apposition. This graft was a little thicker than we'd wanted, but that's what we had been uh, sent, because we, we, we have them ready prepared. But my point is here, here is a case that there is no way we could have attempted without intraoperative OCT. This case is really interesting. This child had a knife wound to the eye and developed a cataract. I want you to see, I think I show it better here, you can see that there is a connection between the lens and the scar here. Now, if I do a corneal transplant on this child and I don't know that, the lens is going to rupture as I take it out and I'm not going to be able to do uh, an implant. And I really wanted to put an implant in. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to be able to cut the stalk. And what you're about to see uh, has never been seen publicly before. This is real-time OCT. I'm using the grid, but I'm moving the eye into the position of the grid to make out where this uh, fibrous connection is. Once I work that out and I know where it is, I'm now going to use an intraoperative, uh, sorry, an intraocular micro scissors to cut that stalk. But I am not looking at the eye anymore. I'm now looking up the scope, down my scope, at this stalk. Now I've got my grid in the position that I wanted, and you can ro rotate this any way you want. And I move the eye. So you'll see in a minute, so I can see my instrument. Everybody told me that I would get a shadow. No shadow. This is not a specially adapted instrument. I'm using a 27 gauge intraocular scissors and I am cutting that stalk in real time, but I can't see that here, but I can see it here. Intraoperative OCT makes life much easier. If you're a very experienced surgeon, you don't need it. But if you are a new surgeon, it flattens the learning curve so that your patients get the same result as if you had 20 years experience under your belt. Once I cut it, I then did the transplant, I put um, an implant in the eye, and then I um, uh, put the uh, top on again. Okay. That's corneal work and complex work. How about this? I have this child. The child has two tubes already. Sent for me for a second opinion. I don't know if the tubes are draining. Really can't tell. So I put the child to sleep. And with the OCT, look, I can see microcysts. So I flush the tube. This is pre-flush. This is post-flush. I couldn't tell if there was a difference. But look at the OCT. A clear difference. So I've now unblocked the tubes. So it gives me confidence in what I'm saying to the parents. Many of you have seen uh, persistent pupillary membranes with plaques. 
Well, with experience, you know that you can probably lift them up without damaging the anterior capsule. But with the OCT, you can clearly see they're separate. And I put my um, heel on in, which is what I use, and lift it up, cut it, and I'm done. What used to be a very slow procedure, because I was worried about rupturing the capsule, became a seven-minute procedure. This case really changed my opinion about intraoperative OCT. This is a child who got toxic epidermal ne necrolysis. Horrible condition. He got the common cold, and then within seven days, all his mucocutaneous junctions fell off. No skin, mouth, eyes, and this is how he came to me. That was his, this was his good eye, that was his bad eye. So, I started off by getting rid of the symblephron, and for the sake of time, I won't be able to show you all the videos, because we, we still have, do I, I, I want to listen to Dr. Uh, Sandan, who has a really interesting talk. But my point is, slowly, I get rid of this very keratinized adhesion. Now, the intraoperative OCT that you're going to see in a second makes a huge... I'm going to move on from that as well. This is what really helped me. The intraoperative OCT shows me that there's a normal cornea underneath that. You'll see in a minute that you can see the cornea and you can see that this tissue is superficial to it. So I start to slowly dissect. And again, continuing dissecting. Now watch this. I use a diamond burr, and this really helped me. If you look here, now you can start to see normal cornea. And the point is that with this instrument, I'm not going to damage Bowman's. I can stay above Bowman's so that I don't damage and cause more scarring. Now this case took me about three and a half hours, but you can see I eventually found a window that is normal cornea, without the epithelium, of course, at this stage. But I'm not going down deeper than Bowman's layer. That's what it looked like. And then as we move on, and we, you can see now, I'm beginning to get a large area. Obviously, this area, the limbal stem cells are damaged. So I did an SLET procedure, having already tissue matched and found that the mother had the closest HLA typing. So, again, very slowly, using the OCD to make sure I don't damage Bowman's, I ended up at the end with this situation, where I put amniotic membrane on, we put the SLET, the little... Uh, uh, part, uh, uh, snippets of the uh, transplant and then put glue on and put membrane over the whole thing. And the child ended up looking like that and was for the first time in two years able to see. Intraoperative OCT. If you work in a hospital that is thinking about buying it, pediatric ocular, ophthalmic ocular surgery will benefit from it. So you should go and say, we can bring, more, we can bring money. It's going to be worth the hospital's while because we can do pediatric cases as well. And if you're interested in innovation uh, of uh, imaging techniques and surgical techniques, we're going to have a whole dedicated session. on the tech. It's going to be a technology village where we're going to be talking about um, innovative techniques at the World Congress. Thank you very much indeed. We'll take questions at the end. Is that all right? I want Dr. Dr. Santan Gopal, who is our uh, president. Thank you so much for making it from your other uh, 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 tasks and uh, appointments. And thank you for coming and talking at the WSPS Symposium. Oh, now I can hear. All right. Now, uh, I'll try and restrict my talk to very, uh, uh, within 10 minutes I want to finish because we are running short of time. 
Now, what is the future in the probably management of amblyopia? In order to understand the future, you need to know the present. If you don't know the present, you will never know the future. So, you need to understand what is the present. Now, you need to know, you need to understand what is amblyopia. Amblyopia is a patient, child is not able to see and surgeon also doesn't see anything wrong. That's simple definition of amblyopia. Now, why the child is not able to see in amblyopia? In order to understand that, you need to know what, how does the child see even in normal conditions. See how one thing relates to the other. If you know how the child sees in normal, then you know why there is abnormal vision. So you need to know the basics. If you know your basics, you are not likely to go wrong. If your foundation is strong, you can build any taller building, it will not, it will not collapse. Now, vision is a dichotomous, vision is actually an electrochemical process which starts at the receptors, where the light is converted into nervous neural energy. The first stage, the neural energy is received, is at the ganglion cell layer. And after the, it is received at the ganglion cell layer, it goes via the retina, nerve fibers into lateral geniculate body. From the lateral geniculate body, it goes to the occipital cortex. Now, vision has many dichotomous and parallel processes, streams, with horizontal interconnections. It's very simple. In the, in the retinal level, there are central P ganglion cells, which have larger representation in the brain, and a peripheral M ganglion cells, which have a smaller representation. But the P ganglion cells occupy central 10%, whereas the M cells occupy the peripheral 90%, but the cortical representation of central 10% is much more than the peripheral the, the reason for that is the central retinal ganglion cells are involved in analyzing the object. So therefore they have a larger representation. Then again nasal and temporal dichotomy is there and then the cells go to lateral geniculate body where M cells and P cells are, dif are differentiated and distributed in the lateral geniculate body in layer 1 to 6. So Layer 1 and 2 uh, have magnocellular cells and 3, 4, 5, 6 have parvocellular cells. So there again, a larger representation even in the lateral geniculate body of the parvocellular cells which are only 10%. Now, once you know this, from here the fibers go to the cortex. So the lowest level of the cortical representation is at V1. So if you just say V1, where in V1? Comes. So you need to understand V1. V1 has many layers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, again. Now, all stratified. The reason why it's done is the vision cannot have a chaotic process. All the fibers responsible for right eye, left eye, temporal, nasal retina, they go all separately, they go. Then again, color fibers go separately. Then again, texture fibers go separately. Then again, the, the fibers responsible for the stereopsis, they distribute separately. See, it's a, they, they, are, they are going like streams, but when they are going like streams, there are still interconnection. It's not that they are independent of each other. So the magnocellular fibers and the parvocellular fibers discharge in level 4C, which again has two layers, 4C alpha and 4C beta. So parvocellular layers and ma magnocellular layers discharge discharge onto 4C alpha and P fibers into 4C beta. From here again, they go by, by a different path. So the M fibers which are responsible for wear of the object and the P fibers which are responsible for what of the objects, they go to separate areas in the brain. There is a reason why it is constructed like that, so that there is an organized process. It's not a disorganized process like traffic in Bangalore. So this organized process is what gives rise to normal vision. Now in amblyopia what happens? This organized process is reduced. The, the cells which discharge onto the binocular cells, there is a reduction in the size of the binocular cells in V1. Now reduction in the size, does it mean reduction in the function? Yes. Reduction in the size, does it mean 
that the cells do not recover their function, the answer is not necessary. Because we know that in certain time if you treat amblyopia, it is a reversible process. It is not completely irreversible. So when you use certain techniques of treating amblyopia, you realize that by patching alone, you can improve vision to a certain extent. Because you are, by patching the normal eye, you are allowing the other eye to have function of the P cells more. But remember, the other eye has M cells also. So how do you stimulate the M cells? That's where the videos, games, etc. come in. Now, you by just by stimulating the M cells, how does the function of P cells improve? That's because of the interconnections. So if you constantly improve the M cell function, automatically the P cell function improves and thereby the vision improves. So this is the, this is the principle behind the various softwares that are available for the child to look at the adjustment of the position or alignment of the eye. The alignment is dependent on the M cells. Gradually reduce the size of the, uh, the, 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 the bars and they ask the child to align the two bars. Okay? And that improves the M cell function. As it improves the M cell function, by reflex, the P cell functions also improve. Simple way is ask the child to play with iPads. There are many games in iPad where lot of things are rotating in the periphery. They stimulate the M cells. And they ask the child to look at the center when these things are rotating in the pit. There are many games. I don't know the names. I saw it long time ago and I thought that is a good idea to use. Now I tell them, use any number of iPad games or uh, even mobile games that improves the vision. It's simple. There is no point in paying $20,000 or $30,000 and all like that. Use simple video games, simple tele uh, mobile games. The child is very happy because I let them play mobile and TV and all. Parents are unhappy. Are you sure what you are doing? I said, I am sure. So, these are the simple ways of treating your amblyopic children. Does the vision improve? Answer is yes. But you recognize early and treat. Now we have the neural basis as to why it can improve. Because the P cells and M cells are interconnected. They are not independent. They are separate, yes. But they are still horizontal connections between these cells as you show here. You see that? They are all interconnected and the streams are going separately. Color vision, texture, position, etc. They all go separately to different areas. But if they go separately to different areas and these areas are not connected with each other, then it has no meaning. So therefore, they are all connected with each other, horizontal interconnections. And this is what we exploit in the treatment of amblyopia by using various video games. I think I'll stop at that. I'm sorry I was late, but thank you very much. Please do attend World Society meeting in December. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. We will pu publish it in our web page also. Thank you. Sir, thank you. Sir, thank you. Sir, thank you. So when the jury come to this? We have that. We also have our consensus statement. So the myopia consensus statement, spectral consensus statement, and the summary consensus statement. So please do take them if you like them. And please come to the World Congress in Hyderabad, 1st and 3rd of December. Uh, sir, sir, can we start the next session, sir? We are getting late. Yes, sir. Thank you.